Hi, and welcome to uh, uh, LSN TAP's presentation on the te Technology Assessment Preparation and Maintenance Toolkit. We're going to introduce ourselves. Joseph, would you, if you'd like to start. Sure, my name is Joseph Mello. I'm the Director of Engineering at Just Tech. Uh, essentially, what that means is I fix things that are broken for the most part. And one of those things uh, is looking at other people's environments for tech assessments. Awesome, wonderful. And I'm Ellen Samuel. I am the Director of Consulting at Just Tech, and I get to work with Joseph and his team of engineers uh, and my team of consultants to help review those systems and make sure that they are tuned up and working well and suggesting any changes for organizations um, if there's any issues. So today we are going to talk about the tech assessment toolkit that uh, we at Just Tech helped write along with LSN Tap, and it is available on LSN Tap's website. We wanted to talk you through a bit about what the purpose and the audience of the toolkit is, how we think you can use it best, what is a tech assessment, what you should do before an, a tech assessment and in order to make sure that it goes well, what to do during the assessment, and then how you should handle things after the assessment. We'll also talk about some best practices and give you some tools and resources that you can refer to uh, on your tech assessment journey. So here is the link to the tech assessment, but it's also very easy to find if you go to lsntap.org and search for the toolkits. There's a section on the front page with toolkits and it will bring you to this and other toolkits uh, that can be very helpful in your organization. The purpose of the tech assessment toolkit is to serve as a comprehensive guide for legal aid organizations offering actionable insights and guidance on how to conduct uh, a technology assessment. It aims to help organizations understand their current technology landscape, identify areas for improvement, and make informed decisions regarding technology investments to enhance their service delivery. The toolkit is designed to address the unique technology challenges faced today by legal aid firms, particularly in terms of budget constraints and the need to use technology effectively to support your organization's mission of providing legal assistance to underserved communities. We wrote the toolkit in order to serve a number of different audiences, but if you are in one of these categories, you're definitely in the right place. First of all, we wrote this with a focus on legal aid, aid IT staff, so the techno technical professionals in the, your organization who are responsible for managing and overseeing your technology's infrastructure. So if you fall into that category, this toolkit will help you coordinate with management ensure, and ensure that there are adequate internal resources for a successful technology assessment. We also considered the toolkit from the perspective of executives or and management. So here we're talking about high level decision makers within the organization. If that's you, this tool can help, toolkit can help you gain an understanding and a high level overview of what a technology assessment is and will help you make informed decisions and effective help you with effective resource allocation towards technology initiatives. We also wrote the toolkit with a third group of people in mind. Maybe you're not IT staff, you're not in management, but you're one of those tech, not, tech responsible individuals or staff. We know um, we, we both have experience in legal aid and we know that sometimes it's all hands on deck and if you're able to fix the printer, you are the person that fixes the printer. So these are individuals within the legal organ aid organization who are maybe not officially part of the IT department, but you take on responsibilities related to technology planning and implementation. People in this category will find some strategic insights and best practices for planning and going through the technology assessment within the legal aid context. In order, by catering to these different audiences, we are really trying to encourage a collaborative approach to technology assessments, which will help your organization 
with the capacity issues related to doing this kind of tech work and really allowing you to leverage your technology to fulfill your mission more effectively. So next I want to talk a little bit about how we structured the toolkit or how to, sorry, how to use the toolkit. Uh, so we structured the toolkit so that you can use it by role, so who you are, by stage, where you are in the process, and then we put some together some best pra practices and strategic insights and some resources. So again, you if you fit into that IT staff category, we encourage you to encourage you to use this toolkit to coordinate with management to make sure that you have enough internal capacity and resources to make the technology assessment a success. For those executives and management, use the toolkit for higher level understanding of the importance of a technology assessment. You could use the, the logic in the toolkit in order to make sure that you're selling the importance of this to your board and to your funders. And then for your tech, tech responsible staff, again, you can find some strategy and best practices and ways to plan uh, for the tech assessment and understanding what you'll be expected to do if you're part of the team who is working on the tech assessment. We talk through various stages of the tech assessment, so it's really important to prepare properly for a tech assessment before you do one, it is a large undertaking. So we offer guidance on how to secure funding, how to choose a vendor if you're having an external tech assessment or having somebody help you with it, and how to prepare internally for the assessment. We also talk about the actual execution of the assessment. So what to expect during the assessment and to help you and your organization navigate this process more smoothly. And then after the assessment is done, that doesn't mean that your work is done. So post-assessment, we have advice on steps to take after your the actual assessment is done, including how to address the findings from the report and to integrate those recommendations into your strategic planning. For our section of the toolkit on best practices and strategic insights, we include some actionable, actionable insights and best practices tailored specifically to legal aid context. So that should help you again with your strategic planning and your effective technology use. We also talk about resource, resource use and utilization. So kind of internally and directs you to some in additional tools that you can look to uh, and resources that we've provided so that you can delve deeper into this topic and um, really go further for a thorough preparation assessment and follow up process. OK, so now that we've gone through those details and the structure, let's talk about what is a tech assessment. So Joseph, can you walk us through a little bit about through what a tech assessment is? Sure. <clears throat> I could say there's a lot of people there in that IT room right now pointing at stuff from the server. <laughs> Probably pretty hot in there. Don't yeah. you think? <laughs> I usually don't yeah. see that many people in a server room myself. I'm usually just the only it's one. It's usually in there. a very small closet. Too. Oh, yes, that's true. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, so I could tell you from a technology assessment, it, and we you, you mentioned this earlier, Ellen, right? It's going to be a review of the environment of what you have, um, the strengths, the weaknesses that you have in your environment. There may be specific things that you're looking for. It, uh, to have looked at in your environment by an IT professional or someone who's going to be doing that assessment. Uh, now, there is a difference here between having a technology assessment versus a security assessment. Uh, so, and, and there is some overlap. We'll get to that in a second. But, you know, the technology assessment is really there to sort of focus on the broader evaluation of what you have in your environment. It's there to sort of really focus on you know, your structure, your reliability, your stability to ensure the operations, the IT operations of your organization. Um, so, for instance, I'm going to be looking at something in your environment, like do you have a UPS to provide power, clean power, backup power to your equipment? A security assessment is not really looking for that. You know, security assessment is going to be looking for things like permissions, data leak information, like well, how is this data flowing? Who has access to it? Right. The, I, the technology assessment is more looking for the, the structure in your environment. Like I said, there is some overlap. A technology assessment is going to involve me looking in your Active Directory and to see who has domain admin rights and who has that sort of um, high level security access to your environment. Um, but 
That being said, a security uh, assessment really should be conducted by a security professional, not just an ordinary IT person right there. If you have an electrical problem in your home, you don't call the plumber, you call the electrician. So same situation here. If you're looking to do a security assessment, hire security assessment professionals, somebody who actually has security um, experience and audits and the certifications that go behind it. Um, so identifies, we mentioned the strengths, we want to look for areas for improvement. So taking back that UPS situation, uh, I may find the UPS in your environment, so thumbs up to that. That's great that you have a UPS in your server room, but then the area improvement may be, I only notice you have your server plugged into the UPS. And so therefore you should have your firewall, your switch, your ISP modem or whatever the equipment is, anything that's IT related should be plugged into the UPS, right? And that's that's the plan for improvement that we would have in the report, in the final report, right? Like you thumbs up for that, but just take it a little step further, get everything else plugged in. Plan a day four, just start removing it from wherever it's plugged in directly to the wall, which is not really providing you any protection at all. And then you plug it into your UPS. Yeah, and then the final great. piece here is, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Adel. No, no, go ahead, yeah. Well, I was going to mention, so there is a difference between the external versus internal, right? Um, everyone may have uh, some IT person in your environment. So if you have your own internal IT administrator, or maybe you have your own MSP that sort of manages your environment, you know, it there is sort of the value of having uh, an outside pair of eyes take a look at your environment. Uh, and it's, it's just, it covers all in all sort of bases. If I'm writing a report for somebody, I'd like somebody else to just kind of review it. I glaze over it as I write it. I expect to have things there. It's good to have someone over my shoulder just to double check. And it's the same situation here, right? I'd I'd feel more comfortable if it wasn't just the same old person who always does the work day in, day out, right? Have someone else take a look at it and confirm that this is how it should be set up in the environment and that it's actually working, right? A little bit of that that sort of testing to verify that it's there. Right. Absolutely, because you, your IT folks might be like, oh, yeah, we have this, we have this, we have this, yeah. we have this, right? Like in their check, head. Check, check, check. Yeah. Right, right. But maybe you don't actually, or it, it's not working for whatever reason. So, yeah, definitely always good to have another set of eyes. Um, we want to just emphasize that even though um, a lot of legal, legal aid organizations have limited budgets, it's still essentially important to make sure that your technology is working and that you are checking up on it. Think about the business disruptions that can happen if your systems go down, if you don't have appropriate backups, if uh, you don't have that, uh, you know, phishing awareness campaign and, and other systems in place to make sure that your systems are secure and are working efficiently and, and properly. So even though it does cost some money, and we'll talk about the costs in a little bit, it is really important to make sure that your organization's technology environment is properly designed, maintained, and managed so that you can support the delivery of legal services, which is the intention of you know, your organization in the first place. I like to is add there one more else thing. You want to add? Yes, yeah, please. <laughs> I was going to say that the other piece, and this is just kind of what happens generally. If I was the IT administrator of an organization and my sole job was to, of course, maintain operations, and I'm given a project to do something like a tech assessment. The difficulty here is that I am kind of dealing with two separate things, right? The daily fires or whatever else my responsibility are, and then focusing on the project, which sadly may never get done just because I'll just keep pushing it back right little by little setting that sort of priority if you have someone who's focused on that one job to come in do it provide you the report sort of end it right you close the book on it that's the other benefit right. of having somebody external do it yeah absolutely especially if you're doing day-to-day -day tech support and you get like nine password resets and then you're like ah, my whole day is gone and I can't work on this anymore right so yeah definitely I agree um okay great so let's talk a little bit more about what you need to do before the assessment. So these things are, they cost money, right? Uh, especially even if you're doing an internal assessment, you need to set aside staff and time, like Joseph was saying, to actually concentrate and do this tools in order to um, make sure that the, you know, to review the environment. But if you are doing an outside tech assessment, you are going to have to probably find funding or at least plan for funding for the assessment. These run in the tens of thousands of dollars, right? So um, 
you know, uh, probably anywhere from twenty to forty thousand dollars, depending on the vendor, depending on what you're doing. Um, and so you really need to make sure that you you're planning as an organization and that you have that funding. Fortunately, there are a variety of um, of places that uh, will can help you with this funding. So, for example, the Legal Services Corporation has a technology improvement project grant or a TIP grant that you can apply for, and that may be able to help fund all or part of a technology assessment. Your interest on lawyers trust account grantor in your state also may have money available for this kind of assessment. We've seen more and more not only that IOLTA programs have money because of high interest rates, but also more of a focus on security. They want to make sure that the people that they are funding have secure systems and are being efficient with their use of technology. You also may be able to find a Cypre award or other grantor funding. Again, make sure that while you're budgeting for this, you're not only considering the use of an external vendor and however much that process is going to cost, but how much it's going to cost to internally manage the assessment process. So we're going to talk a little bit more about who you'll need internally to work on this, um, but you want to make sure that you have money and time available for your internal staff as well. Is there anything you wanted to add that, Joseph? Uh, not on that one, no. But you're absolutely okay. correct on it. Yeah. Um, identifying a, a, or was there anything more that we want to talk about choosing a vendor or was that? Yes. Um, so in yes. terms of choosing a vendor, um, a lot of it's going to be, I mean, there's a lot of people out there who can say they can do a tech assessment. Uh, and it's probably true to some degree, right? There, I'm, somebody's probably really good at looking at one thing and if that's what your sort of focus is look at active directory then yes right but you want a general sort of overview of your environment and the reason i say that is because i've come across a lot of msps that's you know started off as like a phone system um primarily sort of their focus was on phone phone system like implementation and management and then they spread out to doing it related stuff they're not quite good at it right they're they're not that experienced you want to find someone who is experienced with doing tech assessments uh and even better would be to find someone who's done tech assessments and understands the nonprofit legal aid environment right there's not many msps out there that have had experiences with legal aid organizations uh, and those that do have this extra set of knowledge that they understand that the compliance needs, the regulations, the grantees, the funders, the financing behind it. You can't afford the $2 million product to be able to protect your environment. Um, you know, so it's it's just one of those situations that it's better to have someone who could speak your language to be able to do these type of tech assessments. Um, for choosing the, the vendor, you'd also want to sort of, in this part of the vetting process, right? You want to understand what the scope of the project is. A lot of these MSPs come on with sort of their set of what they're going to be reviewing in a tech assessment. Uh, and I'm sure it's going to be very good. It's probably going to cover a lot of different things, but you may have sort of your own things that you want to have to take a look at. So maybe there is something specific about maybe a case management system or a phone system or something specific to your environment that may not be in their scope. And so you may want to review that, ask them about it, add it in if it's not there. Um, another piece you want to look at is possibly a sample of their report. So uh, I'm sure they'll have a sample that you could review, take a look at sort of the kind of findings and the, the recommendations they have. Do they prioritize things? Is it easy to read? Um, can, you know, are they able to sort of communicate something a complex concept into something that's clear for you to understand um, at you as sort of the executive team, but you know, even for your IT people who are going to be working on possibly working on some of the recommendations um, and then have uh, has the vendor sort of worked with some of your sister organizations. Uh, which may be a great set for references, right? And maybe they had a great experience with another organization. You could talk to them about it, what their experience was like. Uh, and then, Ellen, you probably have this uh, in your head too, right? What the project management experience is like, like engaging in a tech assessment. What's the cadence when meeting with the project managers or, or the tech assessment team? Um, what are the milestones? How long is a project going to take, right? And having that sort of um prepared and, and th those expectations set for you absolutely and, and project management is is a really important part of this process because it is a big 
you know, involved process with a lot of communication between different stakeholders. So um, I, we think it's important to make sure that the, the vendor has a good concrete project management plan available when, when finding a vendor as well. Okay, great. So again, one of the things that we walk through in the before the assessment section of the toolkit is how to identify an internal project team. It is really important that you, you know, if you want this to be a success, that the message comes from the management down how important this process is and that people who are going to be involved have the time and the space to commit to working on this that they need. We recommend that you create a project team ahead of time of a variety of different people who might need to be involved throughout the process. So these people will help guide the assessment, help make decisions and provide the vendor with necessary information and resources. Definitely, if you have a chief information officer, or chief technology officer, that pro person probably is going to be the decision maker, but definitely needs to be uh, involved there. If you don't have that position, but you have an IT manager or somebody similar, that person needs to be involved. We would like to see people from upper management and then representatives from various departments. Don't forget about your paralegals and your office staff because they are the ones that know about all those annoying little issues that maybe they're not bringing up to or those workarounds that they've created. And that can be really helpful to get out information to get out. You may not know about it um, so that you can address those to create efficiencies or um, maybe identify sh some shadow IT, right? So what shadow IT is when people are going outside of your system to do things because something's not working within your system. So let's say you don't allow the use of Dropbox for confidentiality reasons, but people can't share things the way that your SharePoint is set up with external parties. And so they're doing things kind of around the side to, to get stuff done and they just need other options to be able to do it within the security of your system. Anything you want to add, Joseph? Um. No, I'd say, I mean, shadow IT is a very real thing. It happens all the time. And that, you know, obviously from my perspective, speaking as the IT person is quite a danger because I don't know what they're doing. They're doing it without sort of notifying anybody. And the concern there is going to be if, if they're using something like Dropbox, for instance, and they don't turn on multi-factor authentication. And I would definitely want them to have multi-factor authentication on anything that's sort of using. So that's where sort of it can be dangerous. Um, yeah. yeah, so communication is key, and that's part of the project. <laughs> right, absolutely. Uh, you know, just another uh, thing that I just thought of was, you know, it, as part of the pandemic, organizations just kind of cobbled together tools, right, and just put stuff together to to uh, make it work. And I, I know that a lot of um, a lot of case handlers will use their phones to scan client documents. And uh, what are they using? <laughs> what are they using to do that? Is it stored in a safe location? Is that approved by IT? What are they using their devices for? So these are all things that uh, we can look into as part of a tech assessment to make sure that um, your clients are pre being protected, but also that your systems are being protected. Okay, so some best practices that we want to talk about uh, to make sure that your tech assessment goes as smoothly as possible. It's really important to involve all of the key stakeholders from the beginning, including the IT staff, all of those parties that I talked about um, on the IT team, but also if your entire organization is going to answer surveys or are going to, if people need to volunteer to talk to the vendor, um, make sure that that's communicated to the entire organization and that people understand the importance of this. Um, Joseph, tell us a little bit about if you have an outside MSP, and an MSP is a managed service provider that provides IT assistance for anyone who doesn't know. What what uh, what do they need to know as part of this process? Uh, yeah, so they certainly should be involved in the process, right? This communicate. If you're going to have this engagement of a tech assessment in your environment, you should let the people who are responsible for your IT health be aware of it, right? They should expect to um, work with whoever your vendor is. Um, they should expect to provide that vendor 
the access they need. So this may be brand new credentials that are being created or access to the equipment physically or even remotely, right? Uh, they need to be made available as well. Like they, I'm sure they have their own schedules, right? So they're going to be part of that project. Uh, it's not just simply the vendor who's doing the tech assessment and yourselves, right? It's going to be the IT professionals, whether that's an in-house person or it's the MSP in the situation. And I would say, I mean, there's in our experiences doing tech assessments, I've worked with a lot of organizations that have had either in-house IT people or the MSPs very happy to work with us, right? That you know, very engaged, you know, part of every meeting, very good communication over email, providing sort of what's needed, answering the questions that we have about the environment. Um, and then there's the other side of the coin, right? Then there's the, the individuals that climb up uh very heavily where they do, don't want to engage uh they don't communicate they they are not responding to emails um i want i want to say seemingly delaying on purpose um for whatever reason that they have in their environment um and there's i've even seen people protest why are we doing a tech, tech assessment at all um that type of situation so it's get that out in front of them first uh, let let them be aware that it's happening and they are part of this project. It's happening. The tech assessment is going to happen, right? Um, so, right, right. yeah, so get that, that that can be the challenges with anyone, not just an outside MSP, but even internal uh, uh, IT staff people. Right, absolutely. And the, the longer it takes for the vendor to complete the assessment, the more it's going to cost you internally, the more it's going to cost the vendor, right? Like delay equals expense and being frustrated by an outside MSP is is going to equal expense to everybody. So definitely I should add as point. well that um with an MSP that it's, it's and we've seen this as well. The MSP sometimes may charge you something outside of the your general contract as well to be part of this project. So again, an, set an expectation for yourself if that's going to be the case, right? Is it going to be part of the work? They may ask how much time they're going to have to spend. Do they have to devote someone to provide these kinds of resources? That sort of thing. So that there may be uh, some time and cost for their engagement as well. That's a great point. Absolutely. So they're, they're going to want to know that you're going to want to know that as part of the budget for the entire project. You also want to make sure that you just are clarifying with the vendor the objectives and the goal and internally, right? Why are you doing this? Is there something in particular that you're concerned about? Is this, a, you know, a technology checkup, which we all need all the time, not all the time, but regularly uh, we need a checkup. So it's good. It's a good idea for the project team to even write down, you know, what are we trying to do here? What are our strategic priorities so that you make sure the assessment meets those intended outcomes? You want to make sure that you are on the same page with your vendor about what's going to come out of this. Are you expecting a written report? Great. Does the scope that the vendor the vendor provide provide a written report? Do certain things need to be included in that report? So you just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page and that you're prepared. Similarly, uh, you want to make sure, uh, as Joseph said, that there is gonna there is a clear scope of work and that you know it's got timelines, deliverables, expected outcomes, communication plans so that you make sure that everybody's on the same page and that you are happy with the results that you get and the, the product that you get out. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, preparing for organizational impact? How might this impact not the, the organization internally, Joseph? Um, so I'd say, and you, you touched on this earlier, right? There's gonna be that resource allocations. Um, there really shouldn't be I'm going to say this, you know, generally speaking, right? There shouldn't really be any disruptions, right? The tech assessment's not here to make changes to your environment. It's about observing the environment, taking a look at what's already in the environment. Um, but, you know, that anything could possibly happen as part of the work. There may be a physical assessment, so we may come into your server and we, we may want to look at something, right? I'm not saying anyone's going to unplug anything in your environment, but is it possible somebody's going to trip over a cable, right? So you just want to be careful, right? This, these are the days that the IT assessment's happening. There should be no disruptions, but you should have that sort of as part of the project management, right? This is the day that someone's coming on site to look at your equipment. Um, right. So I'd and say that's important for security purposes too, right? To know that somebody's co that's coming in. Uh, we deal with very sensitive information in the law, so yeah, good, good 
good to warn people that somebody's going to be yeah. poking around a bit. Yeah. Too. Whatever ID procedures you have, right, that shows that I'm sort of working with. Obviously, when I've done the tech assessments on site, you know, I'm walking around with the IT person. I'm not just walking in solo into an environment. Um, but <laughs> I suppose the good. Surprise. <laughs> a good, uh, yeah, it's a good practice for in terms of security as well, I'm sure. Uh, but you know, I'm walking around with the IT person, right? You know, the the expectation here as well is that the IT person has keys to the server room or whoever. It doesn't have to be the IT person, right? Maybe this is a remote office, but you know, IT access to the server room to the equipment. Um, there's going to have to be as part of the engagement as well, uh, getting credentials to to the environment. Now, if you can get read only access to equipment um, with administrator rights, all the better. Not everything is capable of doing that. Um, but what I'd like to see is that you create an account for me. I use that account with admin access to review things in your environment. And then when the engagement's done, when the project's finished, you blow away those credentials, right? I don't need to keep them, but we're done. You, I don't recommend that you provide me with existing credentials to something that you have in your environment because then you'll end up having to change the password when the engagement's done. Instead, just create me an account and then blow it away when you're finished. Um, so yeah, so getting those credentials, right? There's going to be any IT professional is going to know this. There's going to be dozens, if not hundreds, of credentials that you have saved in your environment in your, hopefully, in your secure password manager. Um, and so do those credentials work? That's the other sort of surprise we get in tech assessments. Oh, here's the passwords to the switches in your in the environment. Oh, we try to log in with those passwords. They don't work, right? Okay, well, then that may cause a delay in the project now because we want to look at the switch and you need to figure out what those credentials are so that we can get into the switch. And that may take some time in order for you to do it or worst case scenario, have you to reset the switch in order for you to get access to your switch, which doesn't have to be done in that precise moment, right? That's something you may have to plan in the future to sort of have done. Um, and then I'd say uh, there's also, you know, in a tech assessment, there's maybe some tools that we have to run in your environment uh, to collect data. And so where can that tool be installed, right? Uh, where can it collect data? And then when it's finished, be removed from the environment. So you may have to have some wiggle room as to having the access to the servers and, and any of the workstations, et cetera. Even if your credentials don't work, that's a good thing to know, right? That, <laughs> At least that that's is valuable be, information, right? It's going to be in the report, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> we also want to make sure that, you know, you and you can you should ask your vendor all these questions, right? Like how how are we going to get you the the credentials? How are we going to ensure that that is a, a secure process? And they should be able to answer those questions for you. Another important reason to pick a vendor that's familiar with at least law firms, but probably legal aid, is that there are special duties in a law firm to protect confidential client information and sensitive information. So you want to make sure that the vendor that your vendor said you are talking to have a plan to be able to protect that confidential information. Now, granted, most of the time we probably don't see anything, right? Because we're not in your case management system. Um, we're not looking at your paper files, but uh, it, it, it can happen, right? So we were on your SharePoint um, doing something and you have client information shared there. It is absolutely acceptable to ask the vendor to sign a confidentiality agreement to make sure that the, the, um, the vendor uh, is is agreeing to protect your client's information as you have to protect your client's information. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, Joseph? Uh, so yes, uh, the credentials part of it, and even the IT documentation that's sort of shared with the vendor as part of the the tech assessment, um, right? There's going to have to be that communication with the IT responsible persons on your end to provide us with that information. And I, I don't want to see that in a non-encrypted email um, or anything like that, right? It's going to be whatever secure method that you can come up with so that the, the password is shared securely to us. Um, and, you know, as part of our job as the vendor doing the tech assessment, right? I'm going to put it in a secure password manager. It's only going to be accessible to myself and, and possibly other engineers who are working on this specific project, not to everyone, you know, at say just tech, for instance. Um, and so there's, there's that level of maintaining that confidentiality, that security, that data that's been collected and reviewed and sort of put together about your environment. And then 
when it's all over, sort of that cleanup, right? I I don't need those credentials. I said that earlier, right? You should get rid of those credentials on your end as well. I'm going to get rid of it from my side and the, the password manager. Right, absolutely. Okay. <clears throat> So moving on to during the assessment, so you've done a great job of preparing, you've got your team ready, you're on the same page as your vendor, your MSP is ready. Let's start the process. So really briefly, I know we've covered a lot of pieces of this already, but Joseph, walk us through kind of briefly from the beginning to the end, how do we usually run these things? Who do we meet with? What kind of tools do we deploy? That kind of stuff. I'd say during the assessment, and a lot of this is kind of like what to expect, is you really should, and speaking for myself coming in, right, doing this tech assessment, is that you really should kind of behave as if you just hired me as a brand new employee for your organization, right? And just like any new employee you're hiring for the organization, especially in the IT sort of area, is... I need to know what you're doing there. If I was a brand new employee in your environment, I have no idea what you have, What, where do your servers live, what's on your servers, how many servers do you have, who has access to those servers, um, if there's a specific role or technology running on it, is it a piece of software that you have in your environment, who uses that piece of software, right? So it's going to be the very first day of my job in your environment to look at this stuff. Um, it's going to be that network security, the data management, the applying sort of best practices um, of what you have running in your environment. I'm going to look for those kinds of red flags, what I would define as red flags in the environment. For instance, uh, your IT administrator only has one account and it's their domain admin account and it gives them access to everything, which is a risk because it's their day to day account they use all the time. And so it's it's a better practice to have your IT administrator use a regular user account with no special privileges for the day-to-day -day operations of like checking emails and going on websites or whatever is they need to do. And when they need to be Superman and wear the cape and whatever else needs to sort of be done, that's when they log in with the special account privilege to be able to do the things they need to do. And then when they're done, get off that account, go back to doing the regular user stuff. Um, so those are our as an example of one of the things I may look for there, I may made sort of the example of the UPS, like what's plugged into the UPS, the redundancy between the offices, the backup system you have in your environment, uh, how long do the backups run? You know, I've been in situations where I've seen people, you know, run backups, but they only run it once a month. It's like, okay, well then what happens if it runs, uh, if it runs once a month, but then your server fails somewhere midway during the month, right? And it's like, okay, well then you need to change that backup plan. That's not a very uh, appropriate backup plan. And maybe the reason why it was set up that way is because you didn't have storage space to be able to back up every day or multiple times a day for that matter. It's like, okay, well then that's part of the recommendation. You need storage to be able to do this stuff. Uh, and so um it could be same with a phone system if you have in your environment, if you have a on-premise phone system, the recommendation likely is going to be, well, what happens if that phone system were to die or your internet connection to that office fails? Does everyone lose phones? Short answer is probably yes. Right? Is that going to be acceptable for you? You, you know, your organization, the executive team may believe, oh, no, I, we want to have our phone system up all the time. It's like, okay, well, then you need to develop a plan to either make your on-premise phone system be available in case those kinds of disasters happen, or you look at another product altogether that is more sustainable when it comes to a disaster like that, like a, a cloud-based VoIP system. Um, appliance is the other piece that we sort of would look at in the environment. So depending on if your organization requires uh, any sort of regulations they have to follow, maybe there's a funder that specifically is looking for something or even an application vendor that requires you to run something specifically or follow certain steps or do these best practices. That's the other piece. And, and certainly something part of the scope that would have to be included, right? This is what we should be looking for during the assessment. Um, I would say probably that the final thing to sort of be considered about is also the way you use technologies as part of the assessment. So if you may have an identity management solution in place like Okta, I would look at Okta, for instance, and see what you're doing with it. And are you using it sort of to the best of its abilities? Um, maybe you have multi-factor authentication enabled for everyone, which is a big plus. That's great. But then I also see that you're using weaker forms of multi-factor authentication, in which case I would say you should really change that so that everyone's using something like an app-based method for uh, multi-factor authentication as opposed to text messaging, for instance. Um, and so we would add that to sort of the recommendations. 
Absolutely. And that, you know, the effectiveness is also where my team gets a little more involved. So Joseph's team is very technical, as you can see, but uh, the, our, my team is very interested in how effectively and efficiently the staff are using the technology and how happy they are with it, right? So we might, depending on the scope of the engagement, we might send out a survey to the entire organization and ask questions like that, right? So what are the weaknesses of the technology in the organization? What are the um, the good things that you like using? Um, does your phone not work? You know, all kinds of things. You know, you, uh, especially if you're higher up in the organization, you may be a bit separated from the day-to-day -day operations and what's working and what's not working. Has somebody been using the same laptop for seven years and they need a new one, right? Like, so we can kind of, uh, gauge some of those staff frustrations and those pain points and the lack of efficiency there based on a survey or staff interviews, again, depending on the scope of the agreement. Okay. Uh, Actually, I wanted thing. to add one thing. Um, sorry, yeah. Ellen, but one of the things you no, mentioned, no, this ahead. is part of that, um, because, you know, as you mentioned, I'm more of the nitty gritty details person in the technology side, right? On the consulting side of doing those kinds of surveys, you know, you may find some users who are quite unhappy with a piece of software technology that's being used. And that's something that's going to be revealed as part of that, that technology assessment, those kinds of surveys and interviews, because they users may get to voice that, oh, we absolutely hate that case management system and it doesn't do half the things they promised they it would be able to do. Right. And so you could help flesh that out and sort of drive the organization in the direction that either will be improving the, the system that's in place or possibly replacing it. Yeah, absolutely. You don't want to have technology that's not working for you, right? Especially if you're spending a lot of money on it. Um, so Joseph has talked through kind of what we're going to, what a vendor is going to review while doing the technology assessment. So after that's done, what they will do is they will take the tools and all the information, the survey results and the interviews they've done, and will they'll analyze that data to identify any efficiencies, any vulnerabilities in areas where the technology is just not aligning with your organization's needs. And the goal of this process is to really form some actionable insights to give to you about things that you can do to make things better. Typically, then the uh, vendor will create a report with recommendations. The report can take a variety of different forms. So if you need it in a particular form, you should clarify that with the vendor before they start writing. Um, sometimes it'll be a PowerPoint presentation. Sometimes it'll be a written report. Um, really, the point of the report is to detail all of the findings, everything that the vendor was looking through and found, any strengths, weaknesses, potential risks that they've found, and then also including specific recommendations for improvements and upgrades in strategic technology planning. Uh, I think in most reports that I've seen, the vendor tries to prioritize a bit. You know, these are things that you really need to take care of right now because this is a pretty serious security risk. And then on down to maybe those uh, less major issues. It's really important to make sure that you are maintaining communication and feedback throughout the process, both with the vendor and internally. Um, the if you have particular needs and wants for this process, again, starting from the beginning, that communication line needs to be open with the vendor. Make sure that they're providing you with interim updates. And if, um, you know, while they're working through the process, you want we the vendor wants to make sure that the final report is aligning with your expectations as needs, as long as that's what you've scoped in the, the agreement that you made. So you want to make sure that you, you're maintaining that open communication. One really important thing that we stress and most vendors I'm sure want is that you, you need to make sure your team is engaged with the vendor and with the assessment team throughout the, the, uh, the process. As Joseph mentioned a while back, if somebody goes and disappears on the vendor, that's gonna really delay the process. So if we're not getting credentials or you're not answering emails or not providing the information 
that is needed for the process is going to delay it significantly. And again, that's going to cost you money. That's going to cost the vendor money. And it's just going to frustrate the process. You need to make sure that you're going to have your staff available in order to answer any interviews or surveys and um, also consider, uh, like Joseph said, there shouldn't be significant organizational impacts, but if the IT person needs to be available at this time on this day, you need to make sure that you have the, the that staff available in order to, to walk them through whatever needs to be done. <clears throat> Okay, so let's talk about what happens after the assessment. So you've gotten an amazing report, uh, presentation likely from the vendor about what you need to do. What now? First, we recommend that you review the report very carefully and uh, make sure that you ask the vendor any questions you have. You'll want to review it with the project team and any other relevant stakeholders and make sure that you really understand the findings and the recommendations and the identified priorities. Next step is to prioritize the recommendations. Again, the, the vendor likely can help you with this, you know, and really point out those really, really important things that you need to handle right now. Um, but otherwise, you need to you need to know as an organization and you need to think about your funding, your staffing levels, and your priorities that really a vendor can't do because they're not in your organization to determine what you're going to work on first, right? So what's going to impact your mission? What's going to be significant costs? What is very urgent? So some of those security vulnerabilities that you need to take out care of right now, right? Those are the things you want to prioritize. Beyond that, we often recommend that people handle those easier, cheaper uh, things first, right? So really get started with things that you can handle um, quickly and aren't going to cost you a lot of money as long as it's not like a big security vulnerability, you want to do that first. Um, and then kind of work through the list going on to uh, work on the issues and make sure that uh, you are fixing the things that need to be fixed. Your process, again, does not stop at the report. You really need to make sure that you develop an action plan with the team, uh, your internal team that has been working on the tech assessment. And you don't want to, you just don't want to lose your momentum or your progress after you've received the report. You need to make sure that you're continuing to improve and working on these changes. So we recommend that you create an a detailed action plan, which has timelines, who's responsible for what, and the resources that are going to be required in order to implement the recommendations. Make sure that you're setting realistic goals and milestones. It likely is not realistic to fix everything in the report within three months or maybe even six months, right? You want to make sure that you are prioritizing things, but understanding that your staff have other things to do and they're going to their services will be needed elsewhere as well. You want to make sure that you have the budget and resources to make these changes. So again, this is something to think about even before you start the tech assessment. The price of the tech assessment is not just the actual price of the review and the report. It's also going to include what you're going to need to do afterwards in order to inc uh, increase your, your technology posture. You won't know everything, you know, not all of those expenses, but it is a good idea while you're doing your budgeting and your planning to make sure that you reserve some money for what you're going to need during after the assessment. So that might include existing resources, additional funding, or adjusting project scopes based on the priority or the in the impact. You want to make sure that you are implementing those changes. So you want to consider one one of the things that we find you know really important is that you are including your staff in any changes you're over communicating what those changes are and you're really focusing on change management so it's really important in order for your staff to be agreeable and do what they need to do to keep your organization technologically safe that they are on board they understand the changes and they're being communicated with and trained properly 
again, you are going to probably need to provide training and support as well to your staff for any changes that are made. So making sure that you keep that in mind, that you budget for that as well, and you know who's going to do that training, who's going to do that support. Are you going to need outside help? So maybe you need a different vendor to train your staff on new systems or change systems, or maybe you need additional outside support. Uh, you can check with vendors for that as well. Anything you wanted to add there, Joseph? Yeah, uh, so in the example you're just talking about now about implementing those kinds of changes, this as a deeper example of it, you know, for perhaps one of the recommendations on the report is you need in uh, a third party email security system when that's better built in than what's already for free by Office 365 or something like Google. Uh, and if that's the recommendation, you know, who is going to do the implementation? You brought this up, right? The responsible persons for wh whoever's handling it within those items on the action plan. And, you know, maybe it is your in-house IT person. Um, if they have the knowledge, the experience, you know, it's something that they they want to do. You know, perhaps they're just sort of more of a tech support person, not really sort of knowledgeable on the higher level type of technologies. And so in which case they may not be a viable option. You may want to look to your MSP or even the vendor who's doing the tech assessment um, project to be able to implement that solution. But then it's not, uh, you know, and there's this is not the case with everything, right? Um, the an email security system is something that gets implement implemented, but then has to be maintained. And so to your point, Alan, um, you know, there may be some training that's involved for whoever is going to continue to manage the, the product that's in place uh, and what that expectation is going to be like. Do, how do you make a change here? What if this happens? How do you set an, uh, an exception? What do you need to review on a daily basis or weekly basis or quarterly basis in the environment? Maybe some documentation has to be created, et cetera. And so that's something else to sort of plan and keep in mind who's going to continue to maintain it once the solution is in place, but also what product is going to be implemented. So the tech assessment vendor may have may not provide you even with a recommendation. Maybe they will provide you with a recommendation on what solution to use, but it's also going to be a matter of what you're comfortable using, right? Whoever's going to may be maintaining it may have familiarity with something like Microsoft's Azure you know, um, or something specific with Barracuda or whatever the product is, and maybe they're more comfortable using that. So that minimizes the training time that, and if it's a good solution, then there's no reason not to go ahead and just use that, right? If you're using an MSP that's managing the environment, they may have an email security solution that they recommend having in place because they're most familiar with it as well. So again, help sort of decide what so solution or product is going to be done or added into your environment. Um, it may also be depending on how you want to handle the situation, right? The IT person in house could it could be used as a learning experience for them, right? Having them involved in the project. They may not be directing it entirely or handling it, being responsible for it. They're just kind of involved in and assisting with it, or it could be the other way around. They're the ones who are responsible for the project, but they may need some help and some guidance, in which case, you know, whoever the tech assessment or the MSP that's sort of involved. Uh, helps them answer questions or guides them sort of what the next steps or the recommended sort of settings that should be set in the environment. Yeah, that's that's great. It's just so important to make sure that you have resources available and training available and that you're planning, right? It's all a part of your technology planning. I also just want to stress, and what we stress in the toolkit is that your organization build a culture of continuous improvement. Really essential here is the leadership's commitment to continuing to improve your technology posture. That will help empower the staff uh, at all levels to contribute ideas for improvement, report issues, and suggest technological solutions. Especially for those programs that they're using on the day to day basis, you really need input from the staff who are using those tools in order to know if they're working or not, knowing if they're worth the money um, and whether you need to make a change. Regular training is super important, something that we have seen our clients, employees talk about constantly. They don't get enough technology training. They don't know how to use the tools efficiently. You need to make sure that you are training your staff, especially on safety issues, right, on, on security issues. But again, if they are not, they don't know how to use the tools that they have access to, that's not good for your organization. We suggest that you allow staff to innovate and experiment. And maybe you have 
the AI is the hot topic now. Maybe you have some AI tools that they can play with in a safe way of where they're not putting confidential client information in them so they can see how they can improve processes and client services. Best practices, again, is to measure the impact. So how efficient were we before? How efficient are we now? Um, how, how much were we you know, spending on this before, spending it now, you know, measure those um, changes so that you can see how your organization is improving or not improving. That's important information to have. And use all this information for strategic planning. It's really important that you, you know, while you're planning your five-year, your 10-year plan, that you have technology and technology planning, technology assessments built into those plans in the future um, so that you know when they're coming, you have the money for them because they're essentially important to make sure that you are staying up to date with your technology. Some tools and resources that we mentioned in the toolkit, uh, the LSC technology baselines. So uh, the technology baselines were uh, updated in 2023, and this is a comprehensive guide for evaluating your organization's current technology infrastructure against established benchmarks. This is a great place to start to review and look at your technology. Um, also, the ABA SCLADE standards. So this is the ABA's uh, Standing Committee on Legal Aid and Indigent Defense, which includes guidelines for technology and legal aid and really focusing on client service efficiency, data security, and ethical considerations. We also wanted just to highlight TechSoup is a resource available that sometimes has discounts and educational content uh, tailored to nonprofits, so you can check out there. Uh, and we also, again, want to shout out LSNTAP that has a variety of um, really important uh, information, guides, policy recommendations, toolkits, uh, webinars like this, uh, and they do a lot of a lot of communicating and the listserv, which is really important to make sure that you are asking questions of your peers. Um, and also to shout out all the conferences that we get to go to to share information about what we're doing uh, with our technology. Any final thoughts, Joseph? Um, I'd say that, and this is probably cheesy for me to say, tech, technology assessments are important. Um, and they really just sort of give you that insight of what's in your environment. And I, I just, I've met a lot of organizations, right? The executive team really have no idea what's going on on the IT sort of back end of it. It's like kind of behind a behind the curtain. Uh, and so these kinds of assessments are really helpful for them to get an understanding of what's actually in place and what sort of disaster scenario would really have a major impact for them, and what they really should be looking to either change or um, you sort of enforce in their environment to strengthen sort of the, the technology they have. And, and, you know, as I mentioned in one of in the reports, you know, we typically try to include the strengths, right? A good pat on the back. You did good. This is what you have in place. We'd like to see those things. This is great, right? But then obviously the focus is going to be where the areas of improvement are. And, you know, you mentioned this earlier, Ellen, right? That that priority for the low hanging fruit, the big red flags, right? If, we, if we're in the middle of a tech assessment and I see a big red flag as I'm in the middle of doing it, right? I am going to let you know as soon as possible. I'm not going to wait until the end when the reports, you know, sort of written up and we're meeting with you to tell you about the big red flag. I want you to know in advance what's going on. And hopefully it's something that could be adjusted quickly, but there may be some things that will require some time and then with some disruption but knowledge is very important here right the the sooner you know what you have in, in your environment and what's sort of missing the better absolutely and we recognize that these are not cheap assessments to go through but in our experience and i'm sure the experience of other vendors who do similar assessments you are going to save money in the end by getting rid of duplicative, inefficient technology, but probably more importantly is really securing your backups, your business continuity, like you know, making sure that your technology is um, kind of future-proofed and, and um, protecting your employees, protecting your, your systems from um, all the different kinds of things that can happen. So uh, definitely worth, worth doing. 
We want to thank you so much for being with us for this hour. You are welcome to contact us. Our email addresses are up on the screen. I also wanted to thank LSN TAP for having us here today uh, to talk about the tech and assessment preparation and maintenance toolkit. Once again, we thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to, to contact us. And um, yeah, thanks everybody. Thanks, Joseph. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Alan. Take care.